This has been such an amazing time for me tonight. Thank you so much to each of you that have shared your stories with me. Each of you that have prayed for me knowing that perhaps I was exhausted. And each of you that have just smiled. And you know who you are because I catch your eyes. That is such an encouragement to me. So it really does help me to know that you're right there with me. But let me ask you a question. Have you ever felt unseen in a crowded room? Okay, let me ask you another question. Have you ever felt unseen in a family gathering? <laughs> I think that's sometimes one of the most loneliest places I've ever been. But let me ask you another question in another way. Have you ever not wanted to be seen? Okay. Uh, I think we could all answer these questions affirmative. Tonight, I want to keep looking at Acts 1 and Acts 2. There is so much wealth in the Word of God. And we're going to look at uh, different passages in these chapters. And we're going to look at a new day, a new way, with new eyes, and a greater dream. I don't know about you, but I need that daily. I need new eyes and a new way and a greater dream. Uh, Laurie, I'm going to talk to you. One time Laurie and I were meeting in Heidelberg. That's where we meet. That's between our two places. And I haven't told you this story. This is where we tried that special hamburger shop. I was on the train and she was driving. So after we had lunch, we split our ways and I was going towards the train station. And I was praying, God, this you have me here for a reason. Let me see with your eyes and let me see with your heart. And as I was walking down towards the train station, there was this man. Uh, he was obviously clean, educated, from Africa, not from Germany. And I looked at him and God said to me, Lana, you have that 20 euros in your pocket. Give it to him. And I said, I don't do that. <laughs> you know, one euro, two euros. But it was undeniable. He said, I want you to give that to him. So I walked up to him as he was picking up bottles along the street and I gave this to him and he looked at me and he said, why did you do that? And I said, God loves you. And then I kept walking and I guess he was in shock behind me. All of a sudden he ran up to me and tapped me on the, on the shoulder and he said, why did you give this to me? And I said, God told me to. He said, last night I prayed that if God sees me, he will show me this next day because I was without hope and now I know that God sees me. God sees you. Now, one particular team member with our Kainos men ministry, she was from Poland. So when she would go into the brothels, those girls from Poland would just come to her because there's nothing like speaking in your heart language. You know what I'm talking about. Those of you that have my accent, you know when we talk with each other, we go y'all and all of that, okay? You know, there's nothing like speaking with someone from your own country. But this particular day when they were in the brothel, this one girl from Poland didn't want to talk to them. And you know, you don't force somebody to talk to you. And they just let her pick out some literature. And she happened to pick out the Gospel of John in Polish. And so they went on down the hallway and talking with other people. And then all of a sudden, they heard the running footsteps of this girl. And she came running up to them. And she said, this is for me. This is for me. I didn't know if God was real and I asked him to show himself to me today. And when I opened the word, it was talking about in the beginning was the word. And she said, I knew this was for me. And she said, and give one of these to this girl behind me too. Okay. <laughs> you know, God wants to meet us where we're at. 
with that gentleman on the street, Laurie, he said, I wanted to know that God saw me. And then the girl in the brothel, she said, I wanted to know that God was hearing me, that he was here. But let me tell you another story. A good friend of mine, uh, I won't tell you her name, but she is amazing. She came from a life that some would say was very ordinary and there was no hope for her to be used by God. And once again, she happened to be in the brothel and she noticed one girl who was, you know what this is like, she was just holding herself together. If she looked at anybody in the eyes, she would have broken down. You know what I'm talking about, wanting no one to see her. And Donna saw this and she went up to her and she said, may I talk with you? And she said, yes. She said, can I ask you a question? What did you want to be when you grew up? And she said, I wanted to be a dentist. But look where I'm at. That will never happen. And this friend of mine said, can I touch you right here? And she touched her. And she said, can I tell you a story? And she went, yes. And she said, my cousin became a dentist when she was 35 years of age. And she is the best dentist I have ever been to. And the girl broke down. Because not only did someone hear her, they saw her heart. That's seen with the eyes of God. Now, you know, if you don't think God works everywhere, on the street, in the brothel, let me tell you, he also works on the plane coming from Singapore to Germany. And uh, I got on the plane late at night. It was almost midnight, and I said, God, I just want to watch a movie and sleep the rest of this 12-hour flight. You know what I'm talking about. And, and so I got on, I had seen all these movies. I've been flying too much recently. There was nothing I wanted to see, but I saw one thing and I said, David, what can I watch? And he said, what about watching this one? Same kind of different as me. I don't know if anybody has seen that movie, but I do recommend it. So here I got on, exhausted emotionally, physically, and every which way. And I started watching this movie, and I want to tell you about a quote that was in the movie. And this was a man who was homeless, and he was talking to a man who all of a sudden had eyes to see what was happening around him. And he was talking to him. They were having this friendship conversation. And he said to this man, he said, when you see a homeless man and you give him food, you ain't given food which is only temporary. You are saying, you ain't invisible. I see you. You see, God turns trash into treasure. And that's what God does. By the way, yes, I was on the plane. I was tired. I had to watch the movie a second time when I got back to get that quote. Okay, <laughs> you know. But in Mark 6, 34, we see when Jesus landed, coming off from the boat, and he saw this large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And then we've also seen this verse several times in these sessions, Ephesians 2.10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works that God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You see, when Jesus had compassion on the people, when he in his great mercy had compassion on us, he said, you are my workmanship. You are my treasure. And he says, I have a new chance for you, a new beginning. We can leave our failure behind and being seen, not according to how we're right now, 
but according to the plan God already has for us. That's how he sees us. So first, what we're going to look at tonight is a new day. And let me tell you, we're going to see it in chapter 2. I'm going to read this passage to you. Chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Have any of you ever, ever been in a tornado? Okay, this is kind of what it sounds like. The walls were shaking. One lady described the first tornado she was in, and she said it was like a hundred trains coming from all different directions, coming to right where you're at. The sound was amazing. And not only did those in that room on this day of Pentecost hear it, but others were all around as you read chapter 22. But let me pause for just a moment. We hear about Pentecost. We know about Pentecost, that it's seven days after Easter Sunday. And this year it's going to be on May 20th, so it's not far away. And I want you to remember this. But before it was a Christian holiday, it was a Jewish holiday first. And we see this in Leviticus chapter 23, verses 15 through 17. I'm not going to read them now. That's just for you to write down. And it was Shavuot. And it means 50. Sometimes it's translated Feast of Weeks. You see, it was a yearly memorial where many what they were celebrating is when God gave the when God gave the law to Moses on Mount Sinai and they were coming to celebrate and at this celebration not only were they celebrating what God did but often at this celebration they would read from the book of Ruth now in the book of Ruth we see what happened when Naomi and Ruth came and came to Bethlehem and there had been a famine for so long and then all of a sudden there was this harvest they read about this in chapter 3 where this harvest is coming and can you imagine not having food for years at least 10 years we know and then all of a sudden they're celebrating by throwing up the grain in the air and letting the wind take the chaff away and catching the grain. Now, I was in the Philippines for eight years. This is what we would do with rice. And I would throw up that rice into the air with my basket right here and wait for the wind to take the husk away and to catch the rice. And I would catch the husk and the rice would fall to the ground. Okay? It's not as easy as it sounds. But the whole village was up on a mountain and they were singing praises, it says in the book of Ruth, because this is a new day. They're going to have food for this year. Can you imagine the children that are there, the men that are there, the women that are there? It is a new day. And ladies, have you noticed when this happened in that upper room on this particular time? Because you see, Jesus Christ is saying, this is a new day for us too. This is a day when the gospel was going forth using ordinary people going all over the world. Can you imagine the disciples, the mother of Jesus, his brothers, earthly brothers, and they're all sitting in that room and the walls are shaking and they're going, I don't know what's happening. You remember Jesus had told them to wait until the Holy Spirit comes upon you. This is a new day. Jesus has said there's no more waiting. You are to go forth. Now is the time. And ladies, there's no accident that you're here tonight. Because see, God's Word never returns void. He is always speaking. It's not about my words. Because see, God may be speaking to you a completely different passage right now. But it's God's Word. This is a very important occasion. This is the birth of the church. 
And so we see this seven weeks after the resurrection, a new day, not a message of waiting, as I said, but a message of going out. Now the test of Pentecost, and listen to this closely, is not what happened in the upper room, but it is what is happening on the streets afterwards. The test of Pentecost right now is what is happening to you in the Netherlands, in Germany, in Fiji, everywhere in the world. <laughs> you know, that is what it is. And then you read in verse 47 of chapter 2 where it says, the the Lord added to the church daily those that were being saved. This was a new day. But it didn't stop there. Okay, it said when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. I bet they thought the walls were falling down on them, don't you? Uh, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting and divided tongues of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them and they were filled with the holy spirit and to begin and began to speak in other tongues as the spirit gave them utterances so we see the wind was coming at this time the holy spirit with power and then we see fire and it says there was fire on each individual you see because the holy spirit comes to you it's personal it's not just as a group it is personal and it's not a normal fire because it didn't burn them up what have you what would have you thought if fire was above your head you know I would have been ducking or something and then we see it was like wildfire it spread and as you go on and read you see that that the disciples and the others started speaking in languages that they did not know and those outside of the house were saying what is this these are ordinary Galileans they're speaking in my heart language they're speaking to me about the power of God and God's glory because you see anytime we speak and God speaks through us, it's about Him. It isn't about us. And that's what we see in Acts chapter 2. But not only was this a new day, it was also, we see, a new way of what they're going to be doing. And I lost my notes. I got so excited, I went like this on my iPad and it went to the very end. So let me get back up. I'm at the very end. In fact, I'm, yeah, I'm way down. Okay, but a new way, verses 41 to 47, we see what started happening outside of that room. It said they sold their possessions and gave to anyone that had a need. And 3,000 people were added that very day. And then you see where they were added day by day. What were they doing? It says they were devoted to the teaching from what Jesus had said to fellowship, getting together the breaking of bread, praying together. Verse 44, all believers were together and held everything in common. They sold what they have and they met together with gladness and simplicity of heart. How many of you would like to be a part of a community like that? Is that what you've been longing for? Is that what people who don't know Jesus, if they saw a community where it was like this, they would say, I want that. I want that. That's what God has called us to do. And he added daily those who were being saved. But we also see as we go into chapter 3 of Acts, we see it was also a day with new eyes. Okay, verses 4 through 7. Now this is where we get to um, one of my favorite stories. But in chapter 3, okay, this new day has occurred. Peter has stood up and said, these people are not drunk that you see. They were accusing them of being drunk. But this is the power of Jesus. He is the one who has done this. And then they come to chapter 3. And this is where the lame beggar 
is healed. And it said, now Peter and John, verse 1, were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer. Do you see that? They were worshiping. They were going together to the temple to pray at the ninth hour. And a man, lame from birth, was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the Beautiful Gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go in the temple, he asked them to receive alms. So all of a sudden, this is a new day, new eyes, right here. And so we see this man that was laying at the gate called Beautiful. A man who, as we read on, we see he had been crippled since birth, 40 years. A man laying at the gate called Beautiful, but there wasn't hope in his heart. And he was asking for alms, just the leftover coins. And you know, I can just imagine, if you think about someone who is begging all the time, they say one of the hardest things as they've talked to those who this is how they have to get food. They said, no one looks at us. Mm -hmm. You can imagine day by day for 40 years at the gate called Beautiful. He's probably looking down and he said, will you just give me some coins? Will you just give me the alms? It's hard, ladies, to look at suffering in the face. In Luke chapter 7, verse 44, it's interesting. Said to uh, Simon the Pharisee, Jesus said to him, he said, Do you see this woman that was caught in adultery? She was a street walker. And Peter, Simon, didn't see that woman. It's really hard. You know, um, one of the hardest things I had to do growing up and then taking my young children with me to the Philippines was how to deal with all those who had nothing and who were begging. And I had been told by older and wiser people that many of the children that were begging were put there because someone was over them and they were just using the child in order to get alms. And so I said, what can I do? I cannot just pass and not give anything. And, and they didn't have answers because it is hard. And finally, I, I got sacks of rice and I always kept them with me along with a Bible verse inside of it. And when I would hand this rice to someone who was begging, I would say, Jesus loves you and look at them in the eyes. Usually they wouldn't look back. But if they pause long enough, they would. But it is hard to look at suffering in the eyes. I remember my first time in Germany to go into a brothel. And um, I had gone through this time not knowing. And I had said to God when he put this call upon my life, I said, I'm too old. I am unable. I can't do this. Why is it me? But in obedience, I went, not knowing what I would be able to say or what I would be able to do. And let me tell you, God saw me. Because in that brothel on that first time in Germany, as I was talking to one young girl, she looked at me and she said, why did you come here? And I told her an answer. I said, because when I lost a child, I had no hope. And Jesus showed love to me and I came here because of that love he gave me. And she looked at me and she said, if I had only had a grandmother like you, maybe I wouldn't have been here. You see, God heard my cry. I'm too old. I'm unable. He said to me, I see you, Lana. And the reason you think you're unqualified is the reason I say you are qualified. Being old, gotta go for it, yeah, yeah. But that's not the end of that story. I was blown away, I had no words, I could not say anything at that point. And then she looked at me 
and she leaned forward and she whispered in my ear, well, why didn't you come sooner? Because you see, she was unseen and she wanted to be seen as well at that point. There was another time I was in Bulgaria and this, once again, Laurie, when I hang out with you, things happen, okay? So <laughs> if you want things to happen, hang out with Laurie. <laughs> but we were in Bulgaria and everybody else was going sightseeing, but I'm one of these, I'm not a sightseer. And I said, I'll just stay here. I want to work with the refugees from Syria. And I haven't told you this story either, Laurie. <laughs> but, I was there and having studied cultures, having taught cultures, I know a lot of things of what not to do and what to do. And in this particular room, we had a whole family of Syrians coming. This was about 20 individuals with one man who was in charge of the whole group. There were their wives, there were their parents, and you could tell immediately who was in charge of this group. And I knew that I wasn't to talk with the men, and I wasn't to look at them eye to eye. That would have been disrespect. So I started talking to the women, and we had a language barrier. I spoke English, and they did. They spoke English, but I sure didn't speak what they spoke. And so we were talking slowly, and, and I said, I cannot imagine what it was like to come from Syria all the way to Bulgaria. They took out their smartphones. I didn't expect that, okay? <laughs> and then they showed me pictures of what it was like. And I saw the suffering in those pictures. Not only were they coming, only carrying what they had on their backs, but they were carrying one young man who was with them that day who has cerebral palsy. And there was nothing. They could only carry him, all of them. And I, I looked at the pictures and I said, I, I just, I've never lost everything like this. And they paused thinking, of course, yes, you haven't. And then I said, I know I've never lost everything like you, but when I lost a child, I felt like I lost everything. And the wife of the head of the family motioned to her husband, and she said, come here, come here. She understands. She understands. And then we started a time of just telling stories and the whole group gathered around. And this was, this was tough because I was speaking to all Muslims in the dress and the men and I was trying to talk to the men without looking at them in the eyes, okay? And we were talking and we started telling stories. And then I said, I said, can I tell you a story? And of course I was not looking at the man, but addressing the head of the family. And he said, yes. I said, I have a friend from Cambodia. And she was there during the Khmer Rouge. And she had to leave and she was in a refugee camp without anything. And all she could do is cut hair to make enough money to have food. The head of that family looked at me and he said, that is what I'm doing to get money for my family. I was a university professor and now I'm cutting hair. So we went on. There were other stories and then, and then I got brave and I said, can I tell you a story from my Bible? As they were talking to me, trust had built and they said, yes, you can tell me a story. I said, there were two women. They went to a land they left their country because there was no food. They were going, you know, they understood. I said they got there and her husband died and they went because women in their culture as well in biblical days have no rights. And then I said she had to find wives for her sons. Once again they said, oh this is bad, this is getting 
much worse. And I said, and then the sons died. And you could just see their hearts going to the ground because they understood. And then, and then I said, and then there was food back in the country of Naomi. And they said, okay. And I said, and do you know what happened when they returned? I had to keep it short. This is two languages. And they said, what happened? I said, Naomi became the grandmother of a king. Because, see, they had no hope. And the head of the family said, how can this be? And I said, because her God, my God, saw them and answered their prayer. And then they became my Facebook friends. <laughs> Let me tell you, when Jesus saw and it said he had compassion, that type of... You didn't expect that, did you? <laughs> they did. And they still come on my feed and I've starred them because I want to keep that communication. But you see, when it says Jesus had compassion, he looked out with his eyes. That type of compassion is where you're moved deeply. That's like a kick in the stomach. It's that kind of compassion. Let me ask you a question. What if our attention, our seeing, our looking, could reduce someone's pain. Would you be willing to do it? It goes on, Acts chapter 3, and it said, In the name of Jesus, verses 6 through 8, great works were happening. And then in verses 16 and 19, as Simon is talking, as Peter is talking to the rulers, who he was talking very frankly, I mean talking about boldness, he was saying the man you put on the cross, he was the Son of God. He was resurrected. He is here. This is how this man was healed. And then it says, here's what Peter said, Repent therefore, this is verse 20, and turn back that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord until He restores all things. Talking about when He returns. Okay? Now here they were listening to this and it says so many men after this came to faith in Christ. But we always focus on this verse, times of refreshing, and we say this is what I want. But notice the first part of the verse. Jesus saw, we see Peter saw this man at the gate. And then he said to the leaders, he said, repent therefore. Turn around, and if God is speaking to you about not seeing individuals, not seeing the hurts around you, He is saying, repent, come to me, turn around. Your sins are going to be blotted out, and you're going to be refreshed within. We want the refreshing without the other part. But the refreshing comes from that part. Let's be people who stop at the gate. Let's look at the hurting until we hurt with them. No hurrying past, no turning away, no shifting of eyes, no pretending or glossing over. Let's look at the face until we see the person. Because the person is there. In that movie I mentioned to you, I saw on the plane, this man who was a Christian who was seeing for the first time took the homeless man into a museum. And there was a Picasso painting there. I don't know much about art, but this is the one where the lady looks kind of crazy with eyes in different places. Maybe you know which one I'm talking about. And this homeless man said to this Christian man, he said, I see this picture. The painter, he didn't know who Picasso was, the painter is showing the world what's on the inside so we can see the hurt. Wow. Wow. 
And that's what we see. Now, in the Zulu tribe in South Africa, they have a greeting. You know, every country has a greeting. In the U.S., we say, let's have coffee together, and then we never have coffee with the person. <laughs> okay, that's an American. You ask any non-American, and they say Americans are very bad about that. Uh, in Singapore and in Asia, but especially in Singapore, those of you that have lived here, I don't see all of my Singapore friends right now, but they're in here. Um, we would say, when you greet somebody, we would say, have you haven't had your dinner yet? Because you see, they remembered during the Japanese occupation when food wasn't there. But the Zulu tribe, you know what their greeting is? This is the one we need to have. They greet people with a phrase that means, I see you. I see you. Change begins with a genuine look and it continues as we see from Peter and John in this chapter with a helping hand because it says Peter put his hand down and helped him up and his ankles were strong and he was singing and jumping and dancing and praising the Lord. But here it is. It all begins when, with an honest look, a real look, with a helping hand, could this actually be God's strategy for the human hurt? Do you think? I think so. First, kind eyes meet desperate ones. Next, strong hands help weak ones. Then, a miracle of God. We do our small part, he does his big part, and life at the beautiful gate begins to be just that. Praise the Lord for that. So, number four, a greater dream. So what is this God-designed way to live? All this talk about having a heart for the world that you've heard from me may sound a bit cliche and even seem a little bit hollow. So what does it really mean to live for the glory of Christ in all nations? Imagine for a moment yourself back when you were pre preparing in the university to get a degree. You were moving towards that goal. This is what it means. We were created for something much greater than what we're doing right now and we are to be moving towards that goal. Let me tell you a story of some good friends of mine. This is an American couple who was an, a, a successful businessman, made so much money, Charles and Karen Clark. I don't know if anybody knows them, but uh, they were having successful life and then God burdened them that they were not seeing the people around them. They weren't telling the world about Jesus Christ. They resigned this position and became missionaries in all through Latin America because they said we can do nothing else. How can we continue serving and not seeing the world? And then, not too long ago, November, when I was talking to a 95-year-old woman after a session where I had been speaking to the group about Kainos and what I do, and this 95-year-old woman is who I want to be. I'm not quite 95. You may think I am, but I'm not. <laughs> this is who I want to be. And we were talking afterwards, and she told me, she said, Lana, my greatest sorrow right now is that I'm not serving the Lord. She said, two years ago, I was teaching in the college department, and now I can't drive, so I can't teach anymore. And I thought, wow, 95 years of age and then she told me her story you see her husband and she had been teaching together until he passed away 
and he had been in World War II in Germany and through some of the things that happened he developed severe burns and they were so bad and this German family took him in and during the day they put him in the potato bin and covered him up while all the other soldiers were looking for him trying to find him and then at night they would painfully all night take all the scabs off and took care of him and that impacted his life when he got back to the US he said how can I not do what this German family did for me and until his dying day he was working with college students wouldn't have you loved to have been a college student with this couple but that's what it means let your heart be gripped with what God wants to do with you okay let's be honest does this sound idealistic to you? Yes, but yet it sounds biblical, doesn't it? This is what we see in the Word of God. God has created us to accomplish a radically global, supremely God-exalting purpose with our lives. I didn't speak this way when I was younger. Maybe it's I just didn't see but I see now potential in each of you. There is something God wants to do through you that He can't do through me. Imagine if just ten of us in this room said, I want to live this radical life. Imagine the stories that are going to be told next year at this time. What if, if this is not only biblical, but it's possible? We saw that in the first session because the Holy Spirit does it in us and through us. So we have a crisis point here, a decision point. And I want to challenge you before I say a prayer and in this time. And I think, I believe we have a song after that. If you want to be coming up at this time, you can. But here is my challenge to you. Will you take time this week to look people in the eyes? My kids have said that, Mom, you have a fluorescent light on your forehead that people, that it says you can cry with me. <laughs> It's not a fluorescent light. It's looking into the eyes of who you talk with. Will you have a fluorescent light on your forehead? The second challenge, this week will you go out of your way to visit a person in need? Go to the hospital. Go to a nursing home. Go to someone you know is struggling in transition or something like that. But will you do that this week? Will you pray with me? Gracious Lord, in the Bible, you are called the one who sees me. You see us. And I know your eyes are always on each of us to guide us, to protect us, to bless us, and to cor correct us. Lord, you have given each of us in this room eyes as well. Will you grant us the power this week to truly see, to see what you have, to see those that you put in my path, to really see them and all their hurts, their concerns, and their challenges. As you open my eyes, Lord, open wide my arms as well to be a friend, to be the hands and feet of Jesus. I love you and I thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>